could we use the moon's regolith to store heat? Why do sunspots look black? And why do black holes evaporate? All this and more in this week's question show. Welcome to the question show your questions, my answers as always, wherever you are across my channel if a question pops in your brain, just write it down, I will gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Katuri, would it be possible to use the moon's huge temperature difference as a power source store heat into mass during days, and then release it during nights? Absolutely. Uh, and this is a technology that's actually being tested here on Earth. There's a place in Finland where they've got these gigantic cylinders that they fill with sand, and then they pump heat into the sand, get extremely high temperatures, and then they're able to extract the heat, they can either turn it back into electricity if they want, or they can just use the heat directly where they can then heat up water and then use that for for homes and use it for heat pumps and ways to keep various places warm. And that technology works really, really well, because sand stores the heat for long periods of time, like you can store the heat in the summertime with solar power, and then you can be extracting the heat months later in the wintertime when you need it. And in fact, this technology has been tested in a simulated lunar environment. So back in 1991, researchers wanted to ask this exact question, can we use lunar regolith as a store of heat energy. And so what they did was they built a bunch of cylinders using various simulated lunar regolith. So the same kind of material that is on the moon, but just made out of earth ingredients, but it, it's rock, right? They started with 1.5 meter cylinder across, and then they went all the way up to about a 4.75 meter cylinder. And when they reached that, and then they put a heat element into the regolith down in the middle of this cylinder, and then they heated it up. And what they found was that over time, as you went through the lunar cycle, you go through the day cycle, the night cycle, the day cycle, the night cycle, but you're constantly putting energy into this rock, that after about 15 days, the core of the rock was getting so hot, that you're reaching pretty much the melting point of the rock. And that was where they had to dial it back that you can't, you know, they weren't able to go any hotter than that. And they found that yes, indeed, you could reach this steady state during the sunlit periods on the moon. When the temperature of the surface of the regolith is very hot, you can be pumping heat down into this regolith storage. And then in the nighttime for the two weeks, you can then be extracting this heat back out. And you're able to run the cycle and make it through that two week period. And obviously, this is an experiment done here on Earth. But the technology should work exactly the same on the moon. And so you can imagine a couple of ways that you would go about it. Imagine you had a rover where its first job was to just pile up a bunch of regolith on top of some kind of heat exchanger that it brings to the moon, plops it on the surface of the moon, piles a bunch of regolith on top, and then every two weeks plugs itself into this heat exchanger so that then it can receive all of the heat that's coming out of the storage pile. And then during the uh, during the daytime, then some other system is actually putting that heat back into the system, and it should work like a charm. So, you know, these are solvable problems. It's just like, what is the amount of energy storage can you use in a spacecraft that's the size of a suitcase? You know, when you think about this, some of the smallest spacecraft that are you know, CubeSats and things like that. But as we get more infrastructure on the moon, almost certainly, the long term heating of a habitat on the moon will be done with some kind of energy storage exactly like that. So I really like the idea. I'm sure you noticed the Star Trek planet name that appeared above my shoulder. And this is a way for you to vote for you to tell us what you thought was the best question, the best answer. Uh, either way, a way to celebrate good questions. So this week, the winning answer was Obi Wan Solari about me giving a politician's answer to a question about whether or not we're alone in the universe. So thank you, everybody who voted. Now, 
We're going to put up a different planet name with each question, and then we'll put a list of them down in the show notes down below and just watch all the questions, watch the entire episode, and then carefully consider what you thought was the best one. And then just write the, the name, the planet name down in the comments down below, and then we will gather them up and we will celebrate next week. Cairdwin7467. Given how oversubscribed major space-based observatories are, would it make sense to launch a small constellation of almost Hubble's that with modern tech should be much cheaper and more compact than Hubble? A bunch of $10 million submeter class instruments should greatly increase data gathering and provide more opportunity to research organizations. There's always this balance. You know, on the one hand, astronomers want to do as much science as they can. And then on the other hand, they want to be able to have things that are pushing the very frontiers of what is possible. And the way this whole process works for the scientific community in the US anyway, is that every 10 years, the astronomers get together and they do what's called the decadal survey. And this is where they sit down and they agree upon what their priorities are. And so you can imagine the meeting where they agreed on the Hubble Space Telescope or the meeting they agreed on the James Webb Space Telescope. They were saying, you know, we need a telescope that is capable of answering these scientific questions. And they laid out what those scientific questions are. So for like James Webb, they, you know, we need to try to peer into the dark ages of the universe, see the formation of the first galaxies, be able to examine exoplanet atmospheres, see protoplanets forming, be able to see the first quasars in the universe and so on. Like they had a bunch of these science goals. And then they ask themselves, what is the telescope that's going to be able to help us answer those science goals? And then all of that emphasis gets put into those missions that answer those. And there just isn't a lot of budget left over. And so, yeah, you could multiply the Hubble Space Telescope by a factor of 10, and it would probably still be oversubscribed, that more people would be using Hubble than, you know, there's, there's no point where Hubble would not have time on it. And there are a lot of smaller telescopes. I mean, we talk about James Webb, we talk about Hubble, but there's a lot of ground based instruments that are in constant use as well. There are four meter observatories, three meter observatories, even smaller ones that are still in active use. And then at the same time, we've got the monster observatories coming, the 39 meter extremely large telescope, which is going to be the most powerful telescope ever built. So generally, astronomers and the people sort of planning out these things, they don't sort of think like, what's the biggest bang for our buck? What's going to give the most astronomers the most tools most of the time? A lot of it's just what is going to push the very frontiers of this science forward. You can imagine a similar argument with say particle colliders, the large Hadron colliders really main and only job so far was to prove the existence of the Higgs boson and it did it. It was the smallest collider that they could build that would still detect the Higgs boson. I mean, they were gravitational wave observatories with LIGO, like it is the smallest detector that could find gravitational waves. And then in the future, bigger ones are built. I don't like and almost we're still a little too early in this process. Um, Hubble was a uh, that's probably enough. Okay, I'm gonna move on. K Swiss. Why do sunspots look black? Black is the last color I expect to see on the sun. Yeah, when you look at the sun, you see the surface of the sun and then you see these dark spots. And those are the sunspots. Of course, always don't look at the sun with the unneeded eye. Uh, don't look at the sun through a telescope. Use some method to be able to protect your eyes when you're looking at the sun. The surface of the sun is 5600 degrees Celsius. And that is extremely hot. Coincidentally, it's the same temperature as the core of the Earth. Isn't that weird? Um, while sunspots are between three and 3500 Celsius, and that is extremely hot as well. But comparatively speaking, when you compare 3000 3500 degrees to 5600 degrees, that extreme difference in temperature is what makes them look dark in comparison to the surface of the sun. But also, when you think about the things that are out there in the sky, like think about a red star like Betelgeuse, the surface is only about that same temperature 
as a sunspot on the sun, you know, about 3500 Celsius. And yet it's putting out an enormous amount of radiation, we can see it hundreds of light years away. And yet it's relatively cool and red. But if it was surrounded by an even bigger star that was the color of the sun, it would actually look comparatively dark. So it's really just that we're seeing that sunspot color in comparison to the rest of the sun. Billions and billions of stars. If we find life, even microbial life on Europa, would we still consider ourselves to be alone in the cosmos? So let's imagine that a future Enceladus Orbilander goes to Enceladus, passes through the plumes of Enceladus, and tastes the plumes and realizes that there is just absolute 100% evidence of some kind of life in the waters in Enceladus. Bacterial life, something, maybe Enceladan space whales. Then the first big question that we would need to ask is, are we related? And that would be a very complicated question to try and answer. It would require some kind of lander, it would require a way to get down under the ice on Enceladus to be able to directly detect. We need to know what its DNA is, if it even has DNA. And that would be the big question. Because there's this idea of panspermia, that life could go from world to world within the solar system, that a Asteroid smashes into, say, Mars, hits a pond where there's life on Mars. That life is thrown up into space. It hides inside of a rock for a few hundred thousand years and makes the journey to Earth and then passes down through the atmosphere and lands and then colonizes Earth. And you can imagine the same thing happening to Europa or Enceladus or any of the ice worlds here in the solar system. So there's a perfectly viable way that life could go from world to world. And so once the scientists got their hands on the bacteria and they actually took it into the lab and they studied it and says, is this material? And they were sure, and this is a big if, they were sure that it didn't come from Earth, that it wasn't just contamination on the spacecraft. Once they'd gotten to that point, then they would try to do some kind of DNA analysis on the life. And if they found that it was related to us, then they could figure out when we shared a common ancestor sometime billions of years ago, when you, you could tell exactly when roughly that rock was blasted off of the earth and made its way to Enceladus, or maybe when the rock hit Enceladus, and that was the source of life on Earth to find our common ancestor. But if it's discovered that there is no common ancestor, that it isn't life as we understand it, that it doesn't have DNA, that it doesn't use RNA, that it doesn't use the same kind of methods that Earth life does, that we are not related at all, that would be a total game changer for our understanding of our place in the universe. Because if life formed twice in the solar system, completely independently, now you've taken like right now, we only know of one world in the entire observable universe that has life on it. But if we find life on Enceladus or Europa, now we know of two. And that is a huge multiplier to our understanding. And so if we did, then you would assume that life would be everywhere that there would be multiple independent life forms evolving in every star system in the entire observable universe. And then of course, the Fermi paradox rears its head again, and you have to wrestle with this question. Okay, so if life is forming multiple times on every world that it can, where is everybody? Why didn't they reach spaceflight? That's kind of scary. <laughs> right? Because it means that whatever doomed all of those other potential civilizations out there in the universe, the fact that none of them reached spaceflight, hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way, trillions of galaxies in the universe, none of them reached spaceflight, none of them went on to colonize their galaxy, then whatever fate met them is waiting for us. So there's a line of thinking and I know there's a Kurzgesagt video where they talk about this that finding life that was not related to us on another planet in the solar system would actually be one of the scariest things that we could find. And I, I, I like that idea. Elijah Petrill 
Why do you think that black holes shrink? Is this due to quantum entanglement? So the concept that you're thinking about is known as Hawking radiation. And this is the calculation, the prediction that Stephen Hawking made that black holes evaporate over long periods of time. And the reason why they do this or why this is expected to happen is based on a bunch of sort of discoveries that were made about the universe. And there's like this traditional ex explanation that you've probably heard where there's like virtual particles that are appearing right at the edge of black holes and then disappearing again. And some of them are going into the black hole and somehow that makes the black hole get smaller. And, and that explanation, the one that was used by Stephen Hawking is wrong and he knew it was wrong. And it's weird that he said it that way. And people have been trying to clear this up for, for decades. When you think about just space itself with nothing inside of it, if you removed all of the energy, all of the mass, all you would be left with is these quantum fluctuations that are space time itself. And if you were to sit in the middle of space, you would be experiencing these quantum fluctuations, but they would all be balancing out. And so you wouldn't feel them. But if you started to accelerate in any direction, and this has been tested in the lab, you start to experience a energy that is coming from you passing you accelerating through these quantum fluctuations in the universe. And the term for this is unruh radiation. I'm never sure exactly how to, how to pronounce it. I apologize. So that sort of let's hold that understanding that as you accelerate through space itself, you experience radiation coming from these quantum fluctuations that are in the universe. So Einstein told us that when you are say in an elevator and you can't see outside and you are falling, it is exactly the same as if that elevator was really far away in space and it was accelerating or you were in free fall that you wouldn't be able to tell these things are all relative that, that they are equivalent. And so you can take that concept and say, okay, if you are close to a black hole, if you are close to any kind of mass and you are experiencing the gravitational pull of that mass, it is equivalent to the acceleration that you would be experiencing if you were just like firing your thrusters, you're moving through space. And so when you're close to a black hole, you should be experiencing that same radiation, but you're not accelerating through space. You're just hanging out near a black hole. And so that radiation from your perspective is literally coming from the black hole. You're getting photons that are coming from the black hole, which are caused by this acceleration. And so photons can't come from nowhere. They have to come from somewhere. And so the black hole literally gives up mass to maintain that equivalence of it creating, causing acceleration around itself. And the part that's really kind of weird and interesting is that the smaller, the less massive black holes actually produce more radiation, hotter radiation than the most massive, supermassive black holes. And this is because of the, of the sort of the gravitational curvature that there's a much steeper gravitational cliff, a bigger edge as you get very close to the black hole. We know that like the, if you got close to a stellar mass black hole, the tidal forces are going to be tearing you apart. And there's this really powerful shear that's happening really close to the black hole. And this creates a kind of a more profound amount of that radiation. But as the black hole is really big, gigantic, you could drift through the event horizon of a supermassive black hole and you wouldn't even feel it. And so you don't have that giant gradient in acceleration. And so you get less of that radiation. And so weirdly it's backwards that the most massive black holes are the ones that produce the least amount of radiation. And so they actually shrink the slowest. It's the least massive black holes, the ones that are producing the most radiation that are also shrinking down. And this is why as, as the black hole gets less and less massive, it puts out more and more energy and eventually it just disappears in this puff of gamma radiation and it's gone.
If you want to support the work we do, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on universetoday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron-only podcast feed and get the overtime segments, as well as other special behind-the-scenes episodes, including our monthly patron-only question show. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. Mark Hamilton, Witcode. Jake Greaterx, David Swenson, Bucko, Muzz, Bob Zatsky, Lee Shalonka, Mickey Melnick, Justin S., Greg Paxson, and Fergal O'Meara. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Sam Dahl, is there any life on Earth that could survive on any of the Jovian moons? Now, I assume that you were asking if there's any Earth life that could survive inside any of the Jovian moons. So you know, do we have bacteria that could handle living inside Europa, Callisto, Ganymede? And the answer is almost certainly yes, to some extent, and it depends on where you go. So, you know, here on Earth, all life requires water as a solvent, and it also requires some form of energy. It could be solar energy, and that's how you get plants, it could be chemical energy. And a good example of that is the, you know, we have the geothermic black smoker vents down at the bottom of the ocean, where hot water is pouring out of the inside of the earth, and a lot of other molecules and minerals and things are coming out as well. And the bacteria has built up around these vents and is is using chemical en energy, they're extracting energy out of the system. And then other crabs and fish and stuff are all surrounding them. And it's the basis of this ecosystem. And when we look at IO, and we see that Io is the most volcanic place in the solar system. It has hundreds of active volcanoes at all times. And then you get a little farther away, you get Europa. And Europa, instead of having active volcanoes on its surface, has this thick shell of water, ice, and then it's thought that there's an ocean of water underneath that, and then it's probably going to have some kind of solid core. And that's like an Io inside Europa. And so the hope is, is that, okay, while Io is receiving so much tidal flexing that it just has active volcanism across its entire surface. Europa has less enough for it to stay warm to keep a ocean of liquid water underneath and a thick shell of ice and maybe enough to cause some kind of geothermal activity at the bottom of the ocean that you do have the same thing you have these these cracks. And if that's the case, then we absolutely have life forms here on Earth that could survive those kinds of conditions in total darkness, just extracting chemical energy out of the material that's coming out of the interior. And then you would have a larger ecosystem that we built on that and the size of that ecosystem and the kinds of Earth life that could survive in that environment are just dependent on how much of that material is available. And we know that a lot of that other stuff has been found on Enceladus, you know, Cassini, before it was crashed into Saturn made a ton of really interesting observations of the moon Enceladus. And not only did it detect these, these ice plumes coming from the south pole of the moon, but it was also able to detect hydrogen gas embedded within the material, it detected various organic molecules inside of that. And so all of the pieces like if you're getting that hydrogen gas that is inside the water, then there's some source that's probably bubbling up that's causing chemical energy that's breaking apart water molecules and releasing the hydrogen. So there's, there's clearly a source. So that's the hope. And so I would say it's almost certain that Earth life forms could survive on Enceladus out at Saturn. The news isn't great for Europa. And this is sort of a level of controversy. You're probably gonna hear some more about this in a little while. We're just starting to report on this. There was a meeting at the Lunar and Planetary Science community uh, about two weeks ago. And one of the presentations was researchers looking at how much geothermal activity is expected inside Europa, and based on the size and based on the temperature gradients and based on the kind of the surface ice, they actually don't think that there probably is much that you're not going to get a lot of of cracks and fissures and faults at the bottom of the ocean that's releasing all of this heat and material into the oceans. And so it could very well be that the ocean at 
Europa is dead, 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 dead. That it's just water with no real easy way to get those additional energy into the system. Enceladus is telling us a much different story. So it's starting to look like Enceladus is the most interesting place, probably in the whole solar system. So that's why we should be going back to Enceladus. Eta Hydrae. Why is the moon gray when almost no rocks on Earth are gray? Well, the surface of the moon is volcanic. And have you ever been to a lava flow? Like have you ever been to Hawaii, walked around and looked at all of the lava that's all around on the surface? It is black, very dark. And in fact, if you were to go to the surface of the moon, we see it as gray. But when the Apollo astronauts went to the surface of the moon and walked around, they said that it was the color of freshly laid asphalt. So think about a road, just a brand new road where they've just put down that black tar and rock material that's going to form the road. That stuff is dark. And the moon would be incredibly bright if it was more reflective. But its reflectivity, its albedo is the same as charcoal of like, it's kind of amazing. And that's the part that kind of blows me away. Like, when we see the pictures, we don't see that we see this really brightly lit lunar environment. But from the astronauts, they said it was it was very, very dark. So why is the moon the color that it is? It is ancient lava flows just over and over and over so much material being you know, spread out across the surface. And then you have meteorite impact smashing it up, turning it into a fine powder across the entire place. But it is still if you took the stuff in Hawaii and you crushed it up, that's kind of what you would be left with. And that's sort of what you would see if you went to the surface of the moon. Tuesday Statzer. Why can't we build a spacecraft in Earth orbit that is humongous and have radiation sort of like traveling? So it sounds to me like you are wondering, why can't we have the kind of spacecraft in orbit in space that are similar to science fiction, and not just spacecraft in Star Wars, where they've got their ion engines and their warp drives, and they're jumping from system to system or Star Trek with their warp drives. But even something simpler, I don't know, like in the expanse, where they've got fusion drives as they're moving around. Science fiction is 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 fiction, it's stories. It's you know, Lord of the Rings has elves and dwarves and dragons and science fiction has warp drives and and wormholes and stargates and things like that. And what's incredible is how much we have actually been able to do to be able to actually make it into space to have people walk on the moon to be able to have a permanent space station that is up in orbit that's constantly going around Earth with astronauts on board that we have sent spacecraft to all of the major worlds in the entire solar system and taken pictures both, you know, in some cases from the very surface of those worlds, we've had spacecraft land on Venus, on Mars, on the moon, we've had spacecraft land on asteroids, comets, retrieve samples, bring them home. But we are at the very early stages of this whole process. Launching payloads into space is incredibly expensive. Like if you were to go down to SpaceX and you were going to buy some payloads on a SpaceX rocket, you're going to be paying about $3,000 per kilogram to put things into orbit. If you wanted to land payloads onto the surface of the moon, you're going to be looking at probably millions of dollars per kilogram to put a payload. If you if you have like you want to put a little telescope onto the surface of the moon that weighs one kilogram, then you're going to pay a few million dollars to be able to do that if you on some future lunar flight. And so the problem is that science fiction has been just filling our minds with what the future of human spaceflight is actually going to be. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Because when you talk to people who work at NASA and other 
the European Space Agency and things like that. And you ask them what influence science fiction had on them choosing this career on the kinds of technologies that they that we want to work on that science fiction is aspirational. This helps us explore this deep need that we have to push out into the cosmos to go to other worlds to see what it's like on the surface of moon on Mars, to go to Venus to go out to the outer solar system, we want to do all those things. And yet our technological level right now today is just not there yet. The International Space Station is humongous. It is a very big machine. Um, but it definitely can't move from Earth orbit. And so as much as it sucks, that we didn't show up in humanity's timeline when we built humongous spacecraft in orbit and we sent them off to other star systems with giant engines like Star Wars and Star Trek. And it might be that that future never comes. But they were an inspiration for us to to get into this process. I was inspired by exactly what you're inspired by. And yet I find what's actually going on what's actually happening to be incredibly fascinating, the real discoveries that are being made the new technologies that are being tested out all the time. And we might not get where we wanted, but we're going to get somewhere really interesting as we get better and better at this whole space thing. So be patient and uh, enjoy what is actually being created. And I'll tell you, Tim Jones, would solar sails ever be practical for human rated spacecraft? I mean, I don't want to say never. But I can't imagine solar sails being practical in the near term until we've got much better technology. The problem with solar sail is that you don't get a lot of thrust change in velocity from sunlight. And so you have to be very patient when you launch a solar sail, it could take you years to get to your destination. Now, you didn't need to carry any propellant on board, you can make multiple movements and to different orbits, you could go to say many different asteroids if you wanted to. But the amount of time that's going to take in space is probably too long for humans to want to be on board. I mean, the big issue that we have with any kind of human rated space flight is that any time spent in space, you're being exposed to the radiation of space itself. And it is hundreds of times worse than what you experience down here on the surface of the Earth. And so when you think about the amount of a radiation load that a human being should be getting in their lifetime, you get that in a year in space in a few months in space, you have received your entire radiation load, and then it's bonus radiation load after that, like the kind that gives you cancer downstream. So solar sails are going to be great for keeping spacecraft oriented for shifting them into new orbits, maybe cargo, if you want to send it from world to world on the slow boat. But but for people, we're going to want whatever is the fastest possible transportation system. So I think in the end, it'll be nuclear fission rockets are taking people from Earth to Mars, and then solar sails are carrying the cargo later on. But no, I don't think we're ever going to want to have people flying on solar sails. But who knows, there could be new technologies that could come out, artificial shielding could be figured out. And then we're living that science fiction future. Mohammed Rashid. What would the view on the lunar surface be like during a lunar eclipse? Would it be all red or very dark? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Because when we look at the moon during a lunar eclipse, that tells us what you would see in reverse. When you look at a lunar eclipse, what do you see as the moon starts to pass into the Earth's shadow, the first thing you see is called the penumbra. And this is sort of a slight darkening of the surface of the moon. And in this case, if you were actually standing on the surface of the moon, you would see the Earth starting to chomp a little bit into the sun. And then you would get more and more of the Earth passing in front of the sun and you your area around you would just get darker and darker as you're getting less and less illuminated by the sun until finally, the entire sun goes behind the Earth and the Earth is from your perspective going to be a lot bigger than the sun. And what you get then, you know, from Earth, we see the whole moon turn red, you know, this idea of a blood red moon. And what that is, is that is the sunlight passing through the atmosphere of the Earth. 
and then you're getting the red wavelengths that are passing through and reaching the moon. And so from your perspective, you would see the Earth black surrounded by this red glow that would be illuminating your area. And then the sun would appear on the other side of the earth and then things would brighten up again around you. It would be amazing to see. Like people always ask me, oh, would you like to go to the moon? Like, yeah, it'd be great to go to the moon. There's a lot of stuff I'd like to do, but I would love to go during a lunar eclipse and see it from the perspective of being on the moon. Behind Chanel glasses, could we ever hope to make a rover strong enough to land on Venus or otherwise get rock samples for return? So the problem with Venus is that the temperature is incredibly hot. You know, it's hot enough to melt lead or other metals um, that are have a lower melting temperature than lead or even above lead. Anyway, very hot on the surface of Venus and incredibly high pressure. And so we don't know of any electronics that can handle that high temperature. So your rover lands on the surface of Venus, and then the heat seeps through the outer shell, reaches the electronics, cooks it, fries it, and kills the rover dead. And this is what happened. I mean, the, the Soviets landed onto the surface of Venus several times with their Venera program, and the spacecraft died within, you know, maximum just short of an hour. And that's the most that we could even probably hope to do. I mean, there's some really interesting ideas that maybe you could extend the lifespan, but you're still not going to be able to go for a long period of time. And then you're sitting on the surface of Venus. And then to actually have a rock sample return to Earth, you need some kind of ascent vehicle. You know, you land on the surface of Venus, you're starting to cook, your rover runs out, grabs a rock, rushes back to the rocket, delivers it, and then the rocket has to be able to fire and get back out through the atmosphere of, of Venus. That sounds really, really tough. So one of the coolest ideas that I like is that instead of trying to go down to the surface of Venus, could we have a balloon that floats in the cloud tops of Venus? It's a very buoyant place there. And we know that balloons would work great. And so imagine a balloon that is able to lower its altitude very close to wherever it's starting to get extremely hot, the very limits of what it can handle and then it deploys some kind of sample to the top of the tallest mountain on Venus where it's at the coolest possible temperature. And could you grab a sample and then retrieve it back up? And then once you've got that back up, you your balloon flies up again, and now it's high up in the atmosphere. And then in theory, you could deploy a rocket from the balloon, and that would just have to be able to fly out into space and make the return trip. So. It would probably be possible with our current technology, but would require just so much money, so much expense. And so although ideas have been proposed, I'm sure I've reported on them in the past. You know, I'm sure if you search universe today for a Venus sample return mission, it's been proposed, but it's another thing for it to be something that we could feasibly do. And there's a lot of higher priorities, unfortunately, then, but Boy, yeah, a sample from Venus would be next level. Alexandra, do you think that Enceladus could evolve life during the sun's red giant phase? I don't know whether it would have a chance to evolve, but when the sun runs out of hydrogen in its core for fuel, it's going to switch to helium burning and it will bloat out as a red giant. It's going to gobble up Mercury, gobble up Venus, maybe consume Earth. There's still sort of conversation about that, but Earth will be deeply uninhabitable at that point. But the habitable zone inside the solar system will stretch out and probably incorporate the moons of Jupiter if they're still around. And so suddenly all of the moons of Jupiter will have liquid water on their surface, which will be really weird. And so yeah, you could then send life from Earth to that area. And for a few million years, it would be able to survive out at Jupiter in the oceans, which is so cool. Um, but I don't know whether life would have a chance, like we think about how life formed here on Earth. I mean, who knows how many tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years that it took for life to evolve. You're not going to get a long time, a few million years before the sun stops being a red giant, turns into a white dwarf, and then it's over. And so if any life does want to evolve on Europa or Callisto, it's got to work quickly. But I do love that idea of Europa and 
Callisto and Ganymede becoming water worlds during that time. And if our places will do that, you can imagine this is happening right now in other star systems where there are red giants, that there are giant planets with what were once ice moons that are now water moons around them. All right, those are all the questions that we got this week. Thank everyone who asked questions in the YouTube comments, as well as everybody who showed up for the live show that we record every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific right here on the channel. So if you want to participate in the question show, it's twice the length. Come join us. I'll have a link to the next event somewhere here on the channel. Subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and you will be told when we have gone live. But it'll be 5 p.m. Pacific time next week. Now I'm going to direct you to another small space YouTuber. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Antonio Lofilara, David Gilton, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Ansis, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Chiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all of our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I have been directing you towards smaller YouTube channels that I think need your support. And so this week, I want to direct you to Anthrofuturism, which is all about lunar development and futurism. And, you know, these are the kinds of topics that I tend not to go that deeply into kind of future, you know, it's Isaac Arthur's beat is futurism. But this talks about like what it would really cost to build a moon base, what are some technologies that you could build on the surface of the moon? What things are going to work well, what ideas are probably not going to work well. So it's a pretty cool channel. And I think you should definitely check it out. As always, please let me know about any under appreciated space YouTubers out there, people who have less than 10,000 subscribers. Hopefully I can drive more traffic. We can build a richer ecosystem of space YouTubers. All right, we will see you next week.